Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Kim Havens. I'm the event manager here at An Unlikely Story here in the mystery department. And I'm so delighted to welcome Megan Abbott this evening to talk about her new thriller, The Turnout with Alifair Burke. Here it is. Before we start, I would like to point out the ask a question button where you can ask, pose any of your questions for Megan. And you can also upvote them so they float to the top. You can also ask your questions in the chat if you'd prefer to do that. If you lose your sound or video, just refresh your page and it'll pop back on. Uh, we are so lucky to have signed copies of the turnout. So if you click on that green button at the bottom of your screen, you can purchase a copy and you will get a signed copy straight from us. Megan Abbott is the award-winning author of 10 novels, including Give Me Your Hand, You Will Know Me, The Fever, Dare Me, and The End of Everything. She received her PhD in literature from New York University. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Los Angeles Times Magazine, The Guardian, and The Believer. She is the co-creator and executive producer of USA's ad adaptation of Dare Me and was a staff writer on HBO's David Simon show, The Deuce. Megan Abbott joins us from where she lives in New York City. Joining Megan this evening is Alifair Burke, a New York Times bestselling author whose most recent novels include The Wife and The Ex, which was nominated for the Edgar Award for Best Novel. She also co-authors the bestselling Under Suspicion series with the incomparable Mary Higgins Clark. A former prosecutor, she now teaches criminal law and lives in Manhattan in East Hampton. I'm guessing where you are now, Alifair. <laughs> The turnout is full of gasp-inducing plot twists, and two days ago on its book birthday, it was announced that it was chosen by Jenna Bush Hager for her August Reads Read with Jenna. Congratulations, Megan! Woohoo! Uh, the turnout is best described, I will paraphrase our bookseller, Bill for his staff pick, he put it best. Megan Abbott has always been expert at diving into the darkest parts of women's souls, but The Turnout, her newest novel, is on a whole new level. The Turnout is easily Megan Abbott's best book, a work of fiction on par with the best of Patricia Highsmith or Shirley Jackson. I fully concur. So without further ado, it is my great pleasure to welcome Megan Abbott and Alifair Burke. Let's see. Yay! Welcome, welcome. There she is. Hi. 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 Nice to see you, my friend. And we looks like there are some friends in the comments section already. So good to see you all tonight. We are cheer toasting my friend, the very talented Megan Abbott. And she told me not to be ashamed of my Cosmo because we're all just drinking what makes us happy these days. <laughs> Going back to the 90s. Um, so I am in total awe of you. I'm always in awe of you. I read everything uh, you write, but I, I really do think this is my favorite yet. And it was to the point, like, I, I'm i terrible. I kind of hate read. Like, I, I read differently than when I was a writer. When I wasn't a writer, I could just read a good book and just be like, I'm so lucky to be able to read this. This is one of those books where it's like, it's just so damn good. Like, <laughs> how'd she do that? How is she doing that? I was reading like whole sentences out, like paragraphs to my husband. And I'm like, listen to how beautiful this is. And he's like, are you really going to read this whole book? To me? I'm like, That's so good. So congratulations. Um, and, you know, it really got me thinking, like, I I've loved all your recent books, but it just seems like you are staking out this unmistakably like Megan Abbott's ground. Like it's like certain people have a certain kind of thing that they, you know, I'll, I'll think of a book idea and be like, oh, that would be a really good Curtis Seddonfield novel. Like, you know exactly like what she would, you know, not what she would do with it, but be like, that's her terrain, you know? And I feel like you have, you've kind of staked out this terrain that um, of kind of these hyper competitive spaces and placing women in them and, um, kind of exploring femininity, but in these really competitive cutthroat arenas. Um, so you did that with, you know, cheerleading and gymnastics and dare me and then science with you will know me and now we're with ballet. Um, and so why ballet? Like, why did you think that was a Megan Abbott kind of space? 
you know, I've, in many ways, I might have done that first. I always wanted to set. So, I mean, it's so intoxicating the ballet world. I think it's um, it holds for a lot of girls and women. It holds this little sort of special, you know, sort of glamorous um, image in our head. But um, uh, so I always sort of thought I wanted to write something in that. But then there was like Black Swan, and it was sort of in the culture for a while. And I didn't know if I had anything to contribute to it. Um, but then I then I sort of had a different angle on it. Then it was sort of, I couldn't have a way in, in other words. What am I going to do there? Um, but then I I, uh, I just sort of weirdly inspired by a completely different thing, which was the Dirty John podcast. Oh, so good. Um, it was so good and there i was really sort of fascinated by the response those of you who don't remember it was this sort of it was i guess a sort of viral podcast hit with it but it was about a real true crime about a serial um sort of con artist who would romance women and steal from them and and do really bad things he was a really bad guy um but the response um in the comments um for the podcast were very angry by women about the women who fell for him. It was very like, really, um, how could you be so stupid? All the red flags were there, which is something, you know, we, we, we experience this a lot if you read true crime or at all, that is not an unfamiliar dynamic, but it was so virulent. And I got really interested in what it would be like if, um, I looked at sort of, in this case, a pair of sisters, um, who you know would sort of take these? One of them is sort of judge very judgmental of the other's uh, romantic choice and other choices, and and then I thought, oh, uh, they could run a ballet school. <laughs> so <laughs> I mean, that's the sort of Frankenstein truth, isn't it? Of writing so many novels, is there's different things you're interested in, and you're trying to see if they could go together. Yeah, but, well, you know, I love to write about sisters too. There's something about a friend relationship where it's like frenemy, competitive. You bring out the best and worst in each other. But I think that's heightened even when it's when it's siblings. So, who, who are these two siblings, and how are they different? Yeah, so it's Dara and Marie, and and you know they essentially were sort of raised each other because they had a rather calamitous childhood as is revealed in the book and it's always interested in those kind of families too where um the siblings sort of seek all, everything they, they get everything from the other because their parents can't can't really deliver they've got their own stuff yeah. going on um so dara is the older one and is definitely the more um authoritative one and marie and this is also you know how you get cast in roles in your family um i know we've talked about this <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know Dara's role is the one who um, says no and sets boundaries and Marie who's her younger sister is though it's sort of wild child who sort of needs to be ta taken care of and contained and she can't take care of herself and sort of you know that that kind of conflict and they were now run this ballet school together that they inherited from their mother so they're not only sis intensely close sisters but they also are business partners so um I figured it would be a way to sort of have all this stuff just keep bubbling up uh, and then bring an outsider in to, to really shake things up. <laughs> uh, yeah. And so the, the outsider, well, I want to stop and talk some before I introduce the outsider, because I feel like the physicality of this book, like you have, you have a PhD in literature. I don't, I'm very literal. I'm a lawyer, <laughs> but I'm like, I feel like if I had a PhD in literature, there's a lot of symbolism in this book. And a lot of it has to do with the, the way their physical bodies are described and the way they use their bodies. So I feel like when you introduce that outsider, the juxtaposition of just like the way you describe the way he moves and his size and the space that he fills is so different from like these graceful, thin, light, people um and the way they're using their bodies so is that an intention so talk about i felt like dare me and and this book obvious an obvious similarity is talking about the the lengths people girls particularly will do to their bodies right and to for their craft um how did you learn all that about ballet i'm kind of all over the place but i was reading this i'm like how does she know all these words that i can't pronounce like <laughs> <laughs> it did take a lot of research because I thought, thought I was a, you know, I like to go to the ballet. I think it's so beautiful, but I didn't really know. I really 
you know, I, I read a lot. I watched a lot. I watched endless hours of, because you can see rehearsals of studios on YouTube. I mean, we have this eagle eye into the private spaces of a lot of professions now that we never did before. But um, I, I sort of really tried to get the insides inside stuff by which I don't mean inside dirt though that's always interesting but like really what it feels like to be doing these things for your body what it really feels like for your to sort of take these beautiful point shoes and need to sort of mold them to be a second skin on your foot like all the that visceral detail is just is just really the whole reason I write anything I just get really into it and I don't think about the sort of um Met metaphorical connotations when I'm writing. It's only after when I have to sort of explain what I was doing or or someone explains it to me. <laughs> um, oh, that's what my book's about. <laughs> do you sort of turn off certain parts of your brain when you're, write, you're writing, right? Or otherwise you'd be, I mean, there's parts we have to be mechanical about to sort of nail a crime story, but there are parts of it, right, that sort of sneak up on you. Um, and I think that that's the way it was for me. Um, so I wanted there to be, I was really interested in the beauty and grace of it and what that required in terms of the toll on the body and the strength and the resilience, and then to sort of bring in this person who is sort of they're all ascetic and and all about making your body this sort of beautiful object of art and a sort of um, almost an arrow. Um, and this person comes in who is this contractor that they hire um, to to renovate the studio, and he is all excess. And he, you know, he's sort of a middle aged guy with a pot belly, and he tracks mud through the studio, and he doesn't care. He, he just, you know, he just and it's so much fun writing <laughs> because. I never write characters like that. I <laughs> um, well, you did it very well. I mean, you could almost like smell him walking in and out of the room to some extent. Yeah. You could hear him, yeah. yeah. I could smell him too. <laughs> yeah, like the floor was moving like when he would walk through, right? Like it's like that kind of presence. So it, but this isn't even a question. It's just another, yet another compliment. Um, I wanted to know how you knew all about the, the ballet because it, it came across, you wrote about it as if it were something you knew organically, that it was just some, something you know. I mean, one of the, maybe it's just me justifying being lazy and not learning about anything new. <laughs> I don't love to do research, but one of the reasons is why sometimes I feel like a book like will reach this halt, like something's going really great and you're into the character and you're into the setting, you're into, um, the voice and it's almost like the writer had spent a ton of time on research and then tells you for two pages what they learned at the library or like yeah. you know i called up an expert and this is what they told me and you see their yeah. notes on the page and it it just didn't it i felt like i was being exposed to ballet in the book without you telling me about it i mean it's what they say right you but it show, is show don't tell but like you really didn't write about it like you were a ballerina i was like i'm like maybe megan's a secret ballerina and i don't know about this <laughs> i still wish that were true <laughs> that is sort of how i th I tried to do really the intensive research before and then i try not to look at it while i'm writing so i only look if i really need to check something or more in the revision because otherwise i will do that you know i I did get my PhD. I know how to dump research into a document, and, and I really don't want to do that. So I did. It. I I really tried to turn that part off when I start writing. Um, but then you you know I I read enough so that I don't have to stop. And then when I do stop, I'm always delighted when there's some other weird detail. I had a wonderful ballet dancer who did a fact check for me at the end and I I try not to do it till the end because I don't want them to over right, right. um but she was great but she had so a couple of details that are like oh man I wish I had known that earlier I mean they inside inside baseball stuff is just what I love and it's one of the things I love about crime fiction is that I mean much like with the law like you're getting you're getting this sort of what it's like I mean we have all these ideas from you know law and order about what it's like to be a prosecutor but when you really talk to prosecutors it's so much more complicated and interesting and messy and yeah all that stuff I love yeah um the uh, one more ballet question so the nutcracker i don't know the nutcracker very well but I, it has to have been an intentional choice so in the book kind of everything that they're going through this interloper 
all of these problems with the studio, which I want to talk to you about that too. Like you and I are all about real estate and construction. And I could, I could feel your energy about that on the page, but this is all leading up to the big annual performance of the Nutcracker and wh why the Nutcracker? Well, it, I was, I mean, I thought of it originally because it is the ballet that I see every year. If I see one ballet, that's usually it. Cause it's so, it's so connected to my childhood. And I think for a lot of, a lot of girls and women, um, because it is sort of a young girl, it's the her the her heroine of that. Um, but then I, I did learn that that's really how most dance studios and schools will make their money. That's their money maker. It makes money for the whole year, not just the ticket sales, but it, it's like a recruitment device because all the little girls in, their, in the audience and their little velvet jumpers at, at Christmas see it and then they want to enroll in ballet like I did. So I thought that it would have this sort of, you know, sort of, undergird everything with this tension that if they need to get it's like a really old thing the play must go on we've got to get you know we can put it on the barn you know that kind of stuff but that that would sort of uh, and then it was really only when i was really deep into the book that i thought oh i should really read the nutcracker uh the original story the et which is an et hoffman's spooky spooky weird weird story it's wonderful and it's so strange and very freudian and and very i didn't realize that i learned it in your book i was like i had no idea i just thought it was like the christmas ballet <laughs> yeah and you really didn't even get attached i mean yeah the original story is it it is i mean there's this sort of uncle with who is an eye patch who uh, is very overly interested in, in Clara, the um the young girl and he gives her this little man to take to bed. Yeah, but that's not creepy at all. Here's this weird little doll for you. <laughs> She's very attached to it and she can't can't go to sleep without the the, the doll. <laughs> and um um, and then embarks on this fantasy. It was, but it was so interesting to me how it had been sanitized, but it's still really in there. I mean, when you go see it, there is this sort of darkness that's true of all fairy tales. You know, it's always undergirding it. It always feels like the stakes are really high in fairy tales. Um, so it, it sort of was one of those lucky things where you stumble into something for practical reasons and then you get all this other junk out of it. Um. So the interloper, I don't think we're giving away. This is always the hard part about doing a conversation about a mystery or a suspenseful book is you you want to talk about all of the twists and turns and you can't do that. But I think it's pretty clear that the interloper is this contractor who comes in um, after they need to repair the studio in crunch time in time for the Nutcracker performance after there's been this kind of problematic unexplained to some extent <laughs> fire. In any event, so contractor comes in. Um, and I, you and I have talked about your feelings about <laughs> And we're looking at your apartment, which was featured recently <laughs> in the New York Times, right? Yeah. And you talked about why you won't remodel your bathroom. <laughs> well, that I would never remodel. My kitchen, I would never, but I'm never going to be able to hire a contractor now because I outed <laughs> myself as someone that's terrified of what a contractor will do. <laughs> very, very rundown bathroom. It, uh, it really isn't that. I mean, it really just was a sense of how vulnerable the people, I had never had a contract in my apartment, but a bunch of people were telling me about being displaced for months on end and having to, um, having not, has no access. And you know, in New York, like you don't, it's not like you have four bathrooms or four, you know, like you have, you have yeah. one bathroom mostly. Right. And so if something's being renovated, your kitchen's being renovated, it's not like you can go to the other kitchen and um, unless you're Martha Stewart. Um, so there, so not only are you vulnerable in that your home is sort of no longer this sort of sanctuary for this amount of time, but you, also I feel like I wouldn't know anything about what they were doing. Whatever they would tell me, I would say, sure, that sounds great, which is what I do now when repair people help me. Um, and it felt like one of those things, like a good plumber or a good mechanic, like when you get one, you want to hold on to, and a good hairdresser for that matter. You're so vulnerable in that position. Um, and, but they are in, in a crunch and they um, go with the, um, they go with the charisma of Derek and, uh, and the low ball um, offer he gives them. So it's sort of, I mean, they're, Real estate is often a factor, I think, in thrillers. Um, it does creep in there, and it just seems like a, a great opportunity. But it's good that you that, that real estate plays this role, or I think just like the the role that houses can sometimes play in a thriller, because it's it's your safe place, right? And so if if suddenly that is infiltrated um, or made vulnerable, it, it 
it changes someone's world pretty quickly, right? So I was, you've read House of Sand and Fog, haven't you? Yes. You read, there was, I don't know if that was on your, probably not, we never know, like, but I was just thinking about the, like, the kind of outsized importance that this childhood home yes. that the girls grew up in. Yes. Dara is now living in it with her husband and uh, Maria's moved out and um, Marie's moved out. And, and I just, I kind of saw their attachment to this home. It was kind of reminding me of that, the weird kind of love triangle almost between yeah. the, the, you know, these two people and a house. Like it's, um, it's exactly. I, I, yeah. exactly, because they, in this case, they were all sort of raised, you know, Charlie moved in with them at a young age because he was the uh, protege of their mother. So they, and they never really left it. They were homeschooled. I mean, those families always really interested me. Um, um, how, you know, I think, always houses take on, houses that we've lived in for a long time, or especially as children already take on this quality. But in the way that sometimes if you visit people in their childhood home, it feels like it hasn't changed at all. You know, there's like right. 70s wallpaper and there's this, um, you know, <laughs> I love all that stuff, but um, it's sort of trapped in amber. Um, so that seems so interesting to me too. Uh, let me see. I've got lots of questions. Um, well, if people have questions, put them either in the chat or the question box. But before I move that, I've, I've got too many questions to ask you. I've got to pick. Um, I do want to ask this question. So I feel like a lot of your books have, have explored, you know, uh, kind of the adolescent yeah. curiosity with sex and sort of that first discovery of like you're afraid of it, but realize it's also can potentially a source of female power. And you, you've always done that so well in your books. But I felt like this was the first time where maybe maybe I'm wrong, but um, because these are these are yeah. adults, right? Yeah. And and it's exploring adult sexuality, but it also kind of felt like through the lens of maybe is it because they're ballerinas, they almost feel forever adolescent, and yeah. that, so um, was that an intentional choice for you to kind of lean into the exploration of of sexuality? Yeah, I guess it felt like. You know, one of the, you know, again, it's sort of the um, arrestedness of the family because they've never left it. They've never really been beyond it, that they would kind of in some ways be perpetual adolescents. And so when, when one of them sort of is intoxicated by someone, then it would be like a, the intensity of, of, of really, even though um, the sisters are 30, that it would really feel like half, half their age in terms of... Um, that and also though that i was really interested in because you're supposed to everything is you look at your body all day long as a dancer you're looking in the mirror it's supposed to be beautiful and that there would be something that in this case that would be upsetting to dara who's the, is less comfortable with all this stuff to see i mean people actually involved in sex it doesn't look this doesn't look like ballet and that it would be sort of so if you if, you, if your life is so much about aesthetics that there would be something very animal and and terrifying to her about that it seemed interesting too so um it's a different kind of arrest but you're right it is that they are kind of it is a kind of in certain ways an adolescent response but with adult bodies and adult um, the risks involved that when you behave that way as an adult right yeah, you mentioned that Dara is the more judgmental one, and like so when she, her like pearl clutching responses sometimes <laughs> just had me giggling so much. I'm like, oh Dara, you need to loosen up. <laughs> <laughs> very very strong views. Get over it, Dara. <laughs> um, so Kim mentioned the exciting news. I um, we've been talking about the book and not the, you know, this is the time where you go out and market it. This is what you know everybody click at the green button for a signed copy of the book, you know, but um, so you got the exciting news that Jenna Bush Higger had picked your book for the Today Show, her book uh, club. So are you allowed to, are you like, is there some secret NDA or how, like, I want to know how long you've known that because I have decided of all my friends, you're the one I'm going to tell my secrets. To. <laughs> I, I, you know, as, as I, but Gigi, I, I did not tell a soul. And if my mom is on this call, as she has been on some of these, she knows I did not even tell my mom until um, 
right after you texted me, which was about 20 minutes before. There had been like a clues, the clues that they give the hour before. Yeah. And then I wanted to make sure my mom saw it. But it was several months and and I'm very superstitious. And also once I sort of <laughs> unleash the gates, you know, I also tend to, I, it's better if I don't tell anybody because then I'll just start telling everybody. So if it, yeah. felt, it felt a little unreal, maybe it won't happen. And then um, it was really well, I'm impressed. I've got a pretty good vault. I, apparently attorney client privilege is also like the Megan Jenna <laughs> Bush yeah. privilege. It's like, I'm not telling anybody that. Well, congratulations. What is that? I mean, it's a dumb question in a way, but like, does it feel different? I, mean, I know that, you know, a lot of the people here are also authors and um, the readers have gotten used to seeing authors on the road when they come in in person, you know, now we're doing it virtually, but there's always that kind of nervous feeling of like, you've worked so hard on this book and like, are people going to find it? Like, is it going to find its way into the right hands? You know, does it feel different or is it, is, is it still the same kind of like, is anybody reading this? <laughs> it's always that, but it's also, there is something like, especially coming out of pandemic here, um, you know, you start to think it, um, is this book weird? I mean, they're all, they're all my all my books are a little weird, but is this you know you start to I started to think how could this be? This is a very odd book, and there's lots of really um, un unrepeatable things that happen in it, and it just feels um, interestingly like exposed to all the weird you know like how weird yeah. is it? And now now there's my mom. Oh, I saw Patty is saying like she's she's saying that. Yeah. Not only are a, a good at keeping secrets, you tell the truth. That's true. You texted her 40 minutes before it was on TV. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so, so yeah, there is, I mean, there's always that, right? Don't you feel a little vulnerable that, that first week where it's sort of like something that has just been yours and your editor, you know, and then it's sort of, it's, it's another, it's another vulnerable feeling, I guess. Yeah. I just sent out like six galleys, you know, for people to read, like very, very early, not even like the buzzy galleries, like the, the blurby galleries. Yeah, I wasn't going to necessarily say you had one, but, um, but I sudden, like the minute I gave them to the UPS guy, I was just like sweating bullets. I'm like, yes. I'm thinking about all the good writers who are going to be reading that. And I'm just like, oh God, <laughs> it does not, it's not a feeling that ends. So, but, you know, I think there's a lesson to be learned for other writers there though, that it's interesting that you said that you thought in some ways it was your weirdest book. Like I wouldn't say weird, but I think it's your darkest book. And, you know, it's not, it doesn't have that typical, like the way a commercial thriller is set up is supposed to work. Like it doesn't follow that pattern, you know, um, and it, it's just like really enticing and you don't necessarily know like why yet you're just like i just want to keep reading this as opposed to like here's the hook on page five you know um and i just think there's a lesson to be learned there that to the extent sometimes we have people in our ears saying if you want these kinds of things you need to write this kind of book and you're saying like even as you were writing it you're like is this book too weird is it too dark like there's a lot of things happening in that book that <laughs> people who watch the Today Show might get a little upset about. Um, and and this is when it happens, right? Like, that's the book that, that's the book, yeah. We as a culture perhaps have shifted <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> the last year and a half or four years or however you want to time it. But I, it's also, there was another kind of other vulnerability. I, I mean, it also weirdly though, I do think it's darker darker points than any other books it actually and this isn't a spoiler but it has one of my happier endings by far and that felt strange too um so um that i was sort of wait how did this happen um so there is that part i mean i knew the the ending of the plot but you know how you really write the last few pages and how they feel um i never know how that's gonna go and so yeah I, that's one of the questions i think leslie had asked in the uh, audience questions so do you, do you often know the ending ahead of time? And did you know with this book and like, do you ever surprise yourself while you're reading? Like, oh, apparently this is going to happen. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I knew the main, I did know the main plot. There were a, a lot of turns that I had to know or I wouldn't be able to, as you know, uh, set them up appropriately and do some, uh, um, diversions. <laughs> but, uh, but, um, there were still some surprises for me usually, and I would be curious to see what it is for you. It's usually the characters that surprise me because you can't yeah. early on, right? And then they'll do something that 
that you don't expect. Um, and in this case, there were some things that, that Dara did that I did not expect at all. Um, so, and then some other characters too. So yeah, so that, and that's the fun part for me really, um, yeah. is that, right? That, that being, right. being surprised as you're writing. The hard part is when, um, I always have a hard time articulating this, but for me, like my characters have to match my plot. It's like, it's yeah. like the plot shouldn't really make sense if it's with different people and the people as I've created them, the plot should make all the sense, if that makes sense. Um, and where I get myself in a corner sometimes is as I get to know the characters better, I'm like, this doesn't really match with the plot I thought I had nailed down. And it's like, so what are you going to change? You're going to change the character. Do you change the plot? I change the, like, I'll, I'm willing to change the plot yeah. before yeah. I'll, like, if I'm real, if the characters have gone that way, it's because I, there's something real happening that went that direction. And so yeah. and I, I think love it when that happens. It's better when they kind of stay on track together. <laughs> Easier, but don't you think is because we were all always you know we're huge readers and we're as kids like that's part of the exciting thing of reading is when the the book and you're, you feel like the the writer or the narrator whoever you're in sync with it so you're kind of going with it and i think when we're writing that if it, you you sort of sense that something's out of sync and you know, you, it won't, it won't, it won't line up. I often have tossed out characters that didn't belong in that book, my secondary characters, too, yeah. for the same reason. Um, you mentioned your obsession with true crime, something you and I both obsess over. I don't really have, I don't have a jam right now. I don't have a true crime jam. Do you, what, is there something that you're really into right now? I, I, not that you have lots of spare time when you're. No, <laughs> If there's one, then that will be what it will be for. I did see the, um, now I can't remember the name of it, but it's the one on Netflix about the, the French woman who lives in Ireland and is murdered. That was pretty good. Um, it's, it's probably on your home screen now, but I haven't had anything to hit the spot that Murder at Middle Beach, which uh, we, I believe we talked about during the pandemic on uh, HBO Max. That was, if anybody saw, that was a that was a great one during during the pandemic. Um, that one where the young man's trying to find out who murdered his mother. Um, oh, you know what? I never watched that. Oh my gosh, you have I have it in my text, like under it's just like a text to myself, like watch this on TV. But I didn't know who told me it was. To be. Yes, it was probably okay, me. Around. Going back up to the top of the list. Okay. Yeah, Galen and I were obsessed with it, but it's. Yeah. During that Zoom, I had texted it to myself, didn't say who told me. So this is the weird text emails we have to ourselves when you're a true crime aficionado because it's sort of watch the Ripper documentary or <laughs> just like random notes you send to yourself, like about dark things you're supposed to watch. When did you start watching the um ah no, I don't remember. We just uh it's a serial killer HBO Max show about a true crime. I don't, you can tell it didn't stick in my head yet. So yeah, well, when you start watching that, I'm like, uh, I don't know, but um, yeah. Someone is asking if it's White House, oh, Julia is asking if it's White House Farmers. I have not seen, oh, Murder in West Court. That was the one I That's just what, uh, yeah, okay. So that now we're like, good. now we're just having our own personal. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm putting a note to myself. Um, I also, um, your TV stuff, what, um, I don't know how you do everything you do. Well, one during the pandemic, while well, I would sleep till eleven o'clock until Cuomo was ready to tell me the numbers. Like, like oops, I just said Cuomo. <laughs> when the governor was going to tell us the numbers, um, you were up like walking in the morning and being productive. And um, have are have you been able to work on your TV projects during all this? Or is I, I have. I have to. I, yeah, it, just because the timing is sort of. I mean, it's been this week. I have not. Um, but. Um, I, yeah, I've been developing the turnout for a limited series, and that that's um, that's that's been weird to adapt something that I had just written, which I'd never done. But I, um, but that's and yeah, I'm, I'm working on a project with George Pelicanos um, based on a John D. McDonald novel. So, oh, how fun! Yeah, so that that's at HBO, so that should be fun. And then I'm doing um, working my first feature script with Scott Frank, um, who made Things Gambit, and it's um, based on uh, Nabokov's novel, Laughter in the Dark, which is his most noirish, it's his most prime, uh, prime book, so. I just don't know how you have time to do all of this. Are and, we still gonna be able to go have drinks? Or is yeah, the no, just gone? <laughs> 
some, they're all at different stages and you know, development lasts forever. And so you never really know if any of them are gonna hit. So it was just, I don't know, it's like a different version of the same thing you were talking about pandemic. I was so anxious. I just said yes to everything because it would felt like it would be like a sign that the world would continue to go on if, you know, if I had these things to do. So um, now I'm stuck with them. <laughs> Uh, so Aaron's asking, um, Aaron Alford is asking if there, do you know if there's going to be another season of Dare Me? Or do you have thoughts on that? It's real, it, no, I mean, I, I can't imagine that there could be now because it's very hard to get everybody back. Um, and it was on USA Network and USA Network no longer does um, scripted shows. So it became part of this Peacock merger and, um, and then, yeah, it was a very sort of complicated streaming wars moment. But there is this sort of move now. I think a lot of them are making this bubble where it seems to be all limited series. No one's sure anyone's going to be able to remember to come back to the show because there's just such a peak TV. Um, yeah. Right. It's just a strange moment. I mean, I think in many ways, limited series are, are better um, novel, you know, novels fit more neatly into them. So. Yeah. And then close it up. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's interesting because I, I, I won't name certain shows, but like a really successful, what was clearly supposed to be a limited series show. It's like, th they'll be like, maybe we should leave the door open for a season two. And, and sometimes it leads to like, not the most satisfying ending. And then, and then you go to season two and it's like, what is left for these people to, to like, we thought we kind of know their story, like, yes. you know, what's going to be their next arc. Um, Julia Dahl was, uh, hi, Julia. Um, are you writing your next book? And everybody hates being, it's like, I just gave you this one. <laughs> Be grateful. <laughs> I have started it and I'm so, uh, actually finally got some momentum on it before I, I stumbled into hot, hot back summer. And, uh, yeah. okay. <laughs> Anyway, no, I've not had a hot back summer, but um, but I, yeah, I have started something. It's very early days, but it, it, I'm glad because I didn't. Novel writing was really hard for me during the um, quarantine, so scripts were a little easier. Um, they're much faster and they're collaborative, so it wasn't sort of you know. I know we've talked about this stuff on our on our quarantine zooms that like being down in the mind shaft of a novel was pretty hard when the world was. Um, falling apart. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't fun. And so, well, I don't want to go, go back into that dark well right now. Hopefully, it's not going to go back there. But um, what were, did you have? Um, so I mentioned one of my um, Cosmos were like my <laughs> Cosmos and Jigsaw puzzles. What, what were you doing with yourself when we were all locked inside? It was a lot of both of those. And it, um, I didn't really. It was the longest time I've had where I got like deep reading in again. And that was a gift to return to as a, you know, I grew up where you'd read a book in two days and somehow the busyness of life I had, uh, I still always have a book going, but I got that deep where I could really like get heavily into something. Um, and I have a, a book club with my, my friend Jack. And so we, we, read, we read all three volumes of Orson Welles biography. Oh. Where, <laughs> and, um, we just finished the Tennessee Williams biography, so we read these really big uh, books, and uh, that that was a big help. And of course, outdoor drinking was a big, big activity for me because it was. So how, how dedicated were you to that? Because I I I bought a wearable true. sleeping bag, and, <laughs> and <laughs> so. you, you were the yeah yeah that's I did not quite go that far, but I. <laughs> I did get a, I did bring a portable space heater once. So. Okay, so yeah, you were one of the people going out even when it was below freezing. Yeah, I think our record was we went out when it was twenty degrees one time. But there were, and we, um, Michael Corita, who some of you probably know, he he was in Maine at the time, so even colder than in New York. Um, and he was the expert on, um, outdoor heaters, and he would send me all of his shopping tips. <laughs> including the heated seat pads. Yeah, I don't want to go back there. I was so happy we cleaned up. We put all of our heated seating pads and all of our like things like in storage. Yeah. And I'm like, I am hoping to never see these again. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I think that's a good superstition. They don't have them around and they yeah. hate yeah. anything. Um, what is it like having a book out when 
your did you know that you were this was all, all going to be virtual like when was that call made pretty much pretty much because a lot quite several months ago there was this sense that there, no one was going to plan anything until maybe the fall would be the earliest for in-store events um just because it would be so sporadic um um and i think um uh, so I did know, and you know, touring has has many stresses. You know, running through airports and always misconnection for me is always in Dallas, Fort Worth. And uh, um, but I really do miss that um, the conversations with the booksellers where they recommend a book, and you yeah. know, they go out to dinner afterward in this at this great local place. And so I I really can't wait till. Um, they at least come back in whatever form they come in, even if it's you know half and half or something. I uh, I, would, I did visit Books Are Magic here in, in uh, New York the other day to sign some stock, and it, it was and it, they weren't even open yet, and they really had to kick me out. <laughs> just You're like, don't make me leave. I want to be here. <laughs> well, I will say, um, not to make promises to anybody, but I very apologetically contacted. Uh, my publisher's people um, and just said, look, I know you can't predict the future, um, but if you had to guess, what does January look like when my book comes out? And they said that they were planning to do in-person events again if stores are doing them. So that that I, that made me hopeful. Yeah, that, that made me very hopeful. I mean, I intend to, you know, fully vaxxed and following all appropriate mask attire will be going to them so i really miss going to them too i mean they're that's even more fun because you just get to sit in the audience can you give a teaser for your book while oh here um i'm very bad at this i should have prepared anyway this oh, is yeah, it's out in january it's not about two sisters but it is about two best friends um and what happens when one of them goes missing and the other one is kind of willing to risk it all to try to find out where she went Sounds great. It sounds great. Um, are there more questions? I don't want to say goodbye until people um, have had a chance to ask their questions. Did I miss anything? I I'm a law professor. I normally, this is when like in an in-person event, I threaten to <laughs> call on people like a law professor, but I don't know if I can actually do that. Like I know Janelle Brown is lurking there. I know Angie Kim is lurking. <laughs> I could cold call on Angie Kim. She went to law school. She knows how this works. <laughs> All right, I think we're all, they've been secretly texting me saying that we both look pretty. Oh. <laughs> if you saw my eyes wandering, I'm like, no, text me, I'm doing something right now. Because we're all missing VoucherCon, for those who, who might not know, is the annual crime mystery convention, which is canceled uh, pretty recently, well, just a few days ago for this year. So I think we're all it seems like a great idea to have it in New Orleans until that turned out. Yes. Not to have worked out for us. So yeah, that was very, very sad. Um, next year. Next year it will be a bacchanalia. <laughs> yeah, I think we've got one more. Um, oh, yeah, this is Leslie's asking, are we plotters or pantsers? Oh, so, it's a girl question. Do you plot in advance or do you shoot by the, you know, go by the seat of your pants? Mm -hmm. I I'm still in the middle. I uh, uh, I think you are too, right? You are you a little bit in the middle. I'm more of a pantser though, I would say. Yeah, well, that's so interesting because I feel think your books are so uh, there's so much architecture to it. Do you revise a lot to get that? Or I okay. yeah, I know I'm a little plot obsessed. Like my father like tells me I'll, I'll be worried about something that like I'm not sure the pacing's right. Like I feel like I'm missing something here, and and he's like plots for amateurs. <laughs> I'm a good writer. Nobody cares what's happening. I'm like, I care deeply what's happening. Yeah. <laughs> and the structure, like, I think it's, again, it's that part of my brain. I'm very literal. Um, I love puzzles. Like, yeah. you want it to feel like all the pieces, like, tumble the right way. So I obsess over it a little bit. But it does sometimes take, um, I sometimes have to work backwards. Yeah. And I, I have done that, too. Even even with the most orchestrated of plans, I feel like things don't land yeah. what you want. But that's also what editors are for. God bless them. <laughs> well, it's funny. So when I, I'm sure it's like a writing room is the same as this. So you can't really wing it in a writer's room because you're thinking everything out together, right? And then parsing things out. You, well, you, by the time you're writing a script, it's so orchestrated because there's so little room. I mean, you would love it. Well, you have done it. So it's like, I was going to compare it to co-op. Yeah. yeah, you know. So it's 
like structure is everything in it. So you have that beach in the room, you know, with an uh, with it, once the series pilots are sort of special because they're sort of halfway between, you know, because but uh, in this theory, you know, everything is plotted out and then you have a beat sheet, which is everything that has to happen in it um, or an outline. And then it does make it really easy to sit down because you you have it mapped. That doesn't always, you know, you always end up making changes, but it does take away some of that anxiety. But there's also um, really no, no room for anything. Um, instinctual yeah, so when, when Mary Higgins Clark and I started writing together neither one of us had really done that before she did with her daughter but you know her, she and her daughter would literally sit next to each other and write together and I assumed she didn't want me to move into her house um, so we weren't going to do that um, but we, and she was a pantser and I was a pantser and I'm like we can't both be just making stuff up you know like while we're emailing back and forth so we actually had to sit down and like come up with the whole thing before we started writing and it's like this is a really sane way to work and like I've been trying to do it on my own and I just I always pull the cord and I'm like no I'm just gonna start writing <laughs> there's the pleasure the pleasure element it does feel like it strips it away so i mean i think it was, it was always some degree of balance but um i i do side with uh the, the muse the muse is ascending which is really just you know our own unconscious coming forward and demanding to be heard <laughs> and then the final question aaron's asking um what we what we're reading right now and then i'll let you go. I'm about to start this. I was going to say, I think I know what your answer is. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I do want to do a big shout out to our friend Jonathan Santlofer, whose wonderful new book, The Last Mona Lisa, comes out in just two weeks, I think. Um, and it's great. He It's about a, a very famous art theft where perhaps the title <laughs> hints at what the work of art is, but it, it's great. And, and that comes out um, just in a couple weeks. How about you? Um, well, I just finished this. Before that, I finished Karen Slaughter's book, and um, I'm reading Samantha Downing's new book right now. And I um, and Tamron, I just finished Tamron Hall has a like that the TV Tamron Hall has a debut novel coming out. So I just um, in the fall, and I just finished that. Amazing! I I knew she had a book coming out, but I didn't realize it was fiction. That's yeah, yeah. It's it's like it's um it's really good. It's a Chicago. It's kind of a a TV. A uh, crime beat journalist who kind of gets personally connected to uh, the family of a victim in a serial killer case, but I mean, she obviously knows the behind the scenes yes. TV journalism thing, and it's 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 good, yeah. And I think it's supposed to be the start of a series, and I I love series. Like I feel like no one does series. I, I want a good female series. Yeah, no, I've gotten very nostalgic for them because there used to be so many. So. Yeah, yeah. When Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much for yeah. doing this. And thank everyone oh for coming. And yeah. Thank you all so much. And I know. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I had to come on screen and thank you both. I'm such a. Oh. And everybody to get, get this wonderful book. It's so good. I promise. Yes. And you get it. Just well, click that button so you get it from, from the store. Yeah. Uh, not, not yes. Not do <laughs> pre-order from some other place or, you know, or mail order it from somewhere else. Get it from the place that brought us there. everywhere. Yes. <laughs> and I thank you so that. much, Alifair. Oh, of course. Thank you for having me. I thank appreciate you, Megan. It. I hope we get to your store, both of us on our, yes. our stores. Anytime. January. Alifair will be in person. Yes. <laughs> I, I know. We would knock to him marble. But <laughs> so thank night. you so much. Everyone have a good night. Bye, everybody. Bye. Goodbye.